you're now enrolled in the school of black negro jitsu <laughs> is it your first day don't worry the master Leroy Stephan and his co-instructors Dave, Mike, and Kyle will take it easy on you, rookie. Enroll in the School of Black Negro Jitsu right now. It's free. All you have to do. There's no hidden costs, no hidden fees. Hit that subscribe button on whatever platform you're on. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play. Hit subscribe, get enrolled, and you'll get completely free access to all of our classes. That's the School of Black Negro Jitsu. That's our main mixed martial arts class. Then we also have our two fantasy classes, the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast and Black Market Picks. And we also have other offerings at the school, interviews, other random things. Enroll now. It's free, guys. Welcome to the School of Black Negro Jitsu. I am your host, the master of Black Negro Jitsu, Lara Stephan. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Dave Mark. What's good, Dave? What's up, Lara? Good to be recording another show. Uh, pretty decent, pretty decent fights this past weekend. Some more fights coming up this weekend. It seems like the UFC is just churning out some cards. So excited to talk about this week's topics. This week's topics, the upcoming fights, this past week's fights. So ready to rock and roll. Yes, yes, yes. We've got uh, we've got an interesting slate at the School of Black Negro Jitsu this week. We've got a special interview with. Uh, Future WB, oh, well, boxing. I'm not going to name all the different associations, but boxing world champion Vaughn Alexander. I believe he's a future world champion. I remember in high school, everybody used to tell me that uh, he was way better than his brother, Devon Alexander, who is uh, was a world champion and is uh, in the world title picture uh, again. I forget who he's fighting here coming up. But um, yeah, we got that interview. We're going to be talking about UFC 221. We're going to do that rundown. Uh, we're going to maybe preview the fights here. We're going to talk about all the latest news. But screw it, man. I'm really excited about this Vaughn Alexander interview. So before I do anything else, that's what I want to do, man. I want to introduce you guys. Usually we have mixed martial arts guests. But we're going to be bringing people from all the aspects of combat. We've had jujitsu specific people and Craig Jones. We're going to have more of that coming up. Uh, now we've got a boxing specific guy in Vaughn Alexander and man is his story very interesting uh, Bright super signed a professional contract with Don King at 18 years old went to prison for 11 years And now is back out and pursuing his dream to be a world champion uh, Hope you guys enjoyed the interview. Hope you guys enjoy Vaughn Alexander's story. Check it out That's Vaughn Alexander Welcome to the School of Black Negro Jitsu. It is excellent to have you here today, sir. Uh, usually, guys, we do mixed martial arts fighters, but today is a very special day. I'm bringing up or, or bringing in one of the, I think, most interesting stories going on in boxing right now. I think it's a story of uh, redemption, of, uh, uh, of uh, let's see, perseverance. Uh, we, we got Vaughn Alexander who, who, who went from one of the probably one of the most promising professional prospects in the nation to being lost in the penitentiary system to now being out and being back on track to being one of the most promising uh, boxing prospects in his respective weight division. Uh, and to add to that, the brother of um, former W, I don't know my boxing titles, W B O W A B A all that, uh, all them alphabets they got over there, man. But uh, Devon Alexander, so you know he's got a wonderful pedigree and was said to be the most talented of the two boxers, Vaughn Alexander. So Vaughn, how are you doing today, brother? How, how are you feeling? Um, when's your When's your next fight? Is it in March? Uh oh yeah, um, yeah, it's March the third. Um, at the Madison Square Garden, uh, I'm fighting on the undercard of Kovalo. Um, yeah, man, I'm I'm great, man. Uh, I'm ready to go. Okay, so you fighting on the Kovalev uh, undercard? Who's he fighting that night? Uh, he fight. I think he fighting another Russian, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, all right. And is that a? I don't know Kovalev. So this must be a. Uh, is this a, like a tune up fight for him? Uh, well, no. Nah, he. I mean, his 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 uh belt on the line, of course. I mean, this oh. this guy this guy this this guy ain't no pushover. I mean, this guy got a hell of a record, so. You know, Kovalo got to come in. He got to be on. He got to be on his his A game. 
Oh, okay, okay, all right. I, I, I just hadn't been keeping up, so I didn't know. But we're here to talk about Vaughn Alexander. Um, oh, of course. Oh, yeah, we're not here to talk about Kovalev, man. So, basically, uh, since this is a mixed martial arts based show and guys won't be familiar with you off the top, let's talk about boxing. Um, of course, like I said, I gave everybody an outline of your career up to this point. You're about, what, 32 years old right now, 31? Yeah, 32. 32 years old. So, grew up boxing. A young 32. Young 32. Grew up boxing. Um... Turned pro at 18 while you were still a senior at Vishon High School where I played football. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so I was a junior playing football at Vishon High School while you were a senior and had turned pro. Um, and you um, then a few years later were convicted of a couple crimes, went to prison for 11 years, got out, continued your uh, – so you, how many pro fights did you have before you went into the penitentiary? Uh, five. I was five and zero uh, before I went to prison. So now you've had six more fights. You're eleven and zero now, past that eleven year yeah. sentence. So that's a brief outline of Vaughn Alexander's life up to this point. Let's get into all the small specific details. So Vaughn, how did you get into boxing? Um, I know you bought you you started boxing around the area I'm in. So I'm assuming that the story starts at the Gamble Center, Twelfth and Park, Tandy, uh, maybe. Um, uh, to do, do, do the wall center. I don't know where it starts. I'm not, nah, I, 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 I ain't start there. I, I beat up all of those guys. I mean, I, I started at um, my first gym was called Hyde Park on the um, Pimrose on the north side. The old, it was the old Fifth District Police Station that they turned into a boxing center for um guys like myself. And uh, yeah, I started when I was uh eight years old. Uh, me and my brother. Uh, I also had another brother that boxed, my brother Lamar. Um, he went all the way up into professional as well, but um, he he didn't continue uh, his career like me and my brother did. Oh, okay. All right. I had never heard of Lamar. I know that you and Devine were at Vishon when I was there, and they always used to talk about you guys and hype you guys up. Well, Lamar, but... Lamar, Lamar, five years older than me, so, exactly. uh, so a lot, a lot of people. A lot, yeah, right. But um, none the less, you started off at Hyde Park. What was your amateur career? Uh, what kind of accolades did it include? What kind of national tournaments did you win? What were your What were your big accomplishments as a kid, man? That led you to being turning into a very young professional fighter, eighteen years old, which is typical of um, especially in boxing. Uh, well, I won, man. I won countless uh tournaments. Uh. Uh, as an amateur, you know, um, me and my brother, we we won countless um, um, uh, uh, um, world championships. Um, um, a lot of the a lot of the big tournaments. You know, you got big four big tournaments um, uh, in, in amateur boxing, especially when you turn open. Open openness is um, where you you can be you can be sixteen. And you can be fighting somebody that's thirty years old, long as you at the same weight class. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's an open division. So you 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 relatively like you grown once you get into the open division, and you usually turn open when you like sixteen. I I think I turned open when I was like six, fifteen, sixteen, something like that. And you know you just fight, um, you just fight everybody all over the country, and um. You know, me and my brother, we always been victorious. I mean, we done had some losses uh, in the amateurs, but, you know, we always been victorious. I had over 300 amateur fights. Uh, I lost, I think I lost maybe seven out of 300. Now, so, did, did you ever uh, yeah. get a chance to possibly go to the Olympics or anything like that? Uh, was that nah, the, the, the Olympic year, the Olympic year, you know, Olympic year was 2004, and uh, I ended up turning pro in 2004, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't push to go to the Olympics. Uh, my my aspiration was to turn pro, and you, exactly what I did. Do you think you could have? Um, was that uh, something that was on the table? Uh, I, I could, I could have pushed to get a spot um, uh, on the Olympic team, but you know, with my with my kind of style. You know, it it was fit for professional, and I, I was ready to turn pro anyway. 
Now, explain that to me. Now, what what kind of style are you talking about? Usually in the Olympics, I guess, because the point scoring system, I'm assuming that right. a voluminous style would be one that would be favorable to participate in that. Watching you, you are a uh, you fight out of the shoulder roll defensive style fighter. Um, that wouldn't be uh, good for the Olympic type scoring, would it? Yeah, because you know a lot, a lot of time, a lot of time with with the with the Olympic scoring and how they score uh, amateur boxing now, it's um it, it's like confusing because like when I was before I turned pro, how they would do it, you got four judges, and in order for you, you can be beating somebody to death, but to, in order for you to get one point, three judges has to press the button at one time for you to get one point. So a lot of guys was winning fights but losing because of the how they was uh, uh, doing the scoring system with the four judges. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Floyd Mayweather, Roy Jones Jr., Evander Holyfield, none of them are Olympic gold medalists. And if you go back and watch those fights, it's kind of clear that they won those fights. Hell, Evander Holyfield about knocked his guy out and still didn't win. Oh, he did. He did knock dude out. But it was <laughs> it was so the the Olympic. It, it's I mean it's a it's a tricky thing when you when you um uh going to the Olympics and I think the last uh, Olympic gold medal that the United States had was Andre Ward, and right. you know he 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 went and he did his thing. He actually won in two thousand four, the year that I turned pro. So, um, did you ever? Well, what yeah. weight, what weight class is uh Andre Ward in? Well, Andre Ward fighting at one seventy five now. And you fight at one sixty one. I fight. I fight at one sixty and one sixty eight. Okay. Okay. Middleweight. Did, middleweight and super middle. Did you? You guys ever cross paths? Uh, no. It, well, Andre actually, Andre Ward fought at. In the uh in in the amateurs and and in the Olympics, Andre Ward fought at 178 pounds. Okay, so he's like it was it was it was only it was only when he turned pro is when he went down in weight. Ah, I see. Okay, all right, all right. But back to your amateur career. So you turned pro in oh my god, what year did you turn pro? 2004. 2004. 2004. Turned pro in 2004. Uh, had did you sign with any big promoter? Coming out, you signed. Oh yeah, who who you sign? Don with? King, Don oh, King Promotions. Man. Yeah. Now, okay, why now? Uh, to us casual boxing fans, you hear Don King, you automatically think of controversy, scandal. Um, why did you sign with Don King? Or, or is that a dangerous proposition in the world of boxing? Are there a lot I of mean, misconceptions listen, about it? It is a lot of misconceptions about Don King. Listen, let me tell you something. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to be on top of your business. Yo, you, listen, just as good as you are in that ring, you just you got to be just as good with dealing with your business. And I feel that if any man, any man can get over on another man, he deserve he deserve to be got over on. So you got you got to have the right people in place. You yourself, first and foremost, got to be mentally sharp. And knowing how to read contracts, knowing what type of money you're supposed to get, your what everything everything that that's negotiable or is, or is negotiated in your contract, these are the things that that you you got your guarantee, and you got things that's negotiable. So you know if I, I wasn't someone, I wasn't someone. You know I've been in, I was in the, I turned pro when I was 18, but I learned so much from the age of eight all the way up until I turned pro. I know how to read contracts, but but at the same time, you still you got your lawyer, you got your manager in place, and it's it takes a collective team to to get the job done. But at the same time, you yourself individually got to know the business before you can even uh, think about signing a contract with someone. If you just someone did sign a contract with with someone to, because you just so quick to. Uh, I'm turning pro. I'm turning pro. Nah, you 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 got your business got to be as just as important as you or your talent. Now let me ask you a question here. Then, when it comes to a promoter, what exactly is the relationship between a promoter and a boxer? Is it strictly um, like what what's the 
what is the goal when you sign with a promoter what are you looking for in that promoter uh what is what is the relationship is it do, do you expect him to be a friend uh just uh, educate everybody out here what is his his task in your career or what you want his, well his i don't know about i don't know about nobody else I don't know about nobody else, but I know how to separate everything. This is something that I was blessed with. I know how to separate everything. Promoter, promoter, fighter relationship. I know how to separate that. Me, it's all about business with me. I'm strictly 100% business. With a promoter, when you sign with someone, the promoter is guaranteeing um, fights. It's guaranteeing when you get to a certain level, you fight for a world title. Um uh money uh that that's what that's why in contracts you everything is is negotiated before you sign the contract that way everything is everything that you negotiated is guaranteed mm -hmm. so 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 when you negotiate everything that and once you sign on the dollar line everything is guaranteed that's why you have uh you have your lawyer in place for for you won't see or, or you won't see uh, look so the, your lawyer can look at the fine print. I'm talking about go over. I, my contract was man hundreds of pages. Oh really? And, but at the same yeah, you, I'm saying listen, you you wanna you wanna you wanna get deep inside that contract. So, so ain't so nothing here. Are hundreds of pages. Are you are you kidding? Uh, yeah. Yes. Oh man, so it's it's not hard to be taken advantage of then. Now it's not hard, but but you got to you got to be you got to be patient. You got to be patient and know what you get yourself into. And a lot of these guys, they don't know what they get themselves into because they so rushed and quick. They see they they see money, and and they so quick to to, to sign the contract. No, nah, not me. Okay, now let me ask you a question then. What are you getting yourself into and what are the potential pitfalls that a fighter that's, you know, first signing his pro contract could get into possibly? Well, you well, you you have your the first contract you sign is actually like your build up. You may sign you may sign a deal for like mm, 2 years. And the promoter may guarantee, uh, I guarantee you four or five fights a year. I might guarantee you, um, uh, I might guarantee you ten, fifteen thousand dollars a fight. That that's just your build up. But then when you get to the, when you get to like level, it's level to your contract. Now you start fighting on TV, like you start fighting on HBO, Showtime, uh, things of that nature. You get to the money, that's where the real money come in at, is when you start fighting on Boxing Out the Dark, um, HBO Boxing Out the Dark, Showtime Boxing Out the Dark, uh, Showtime Championship Boxing, HBO Championship Boxing, that's where the real money come in at. And, you know, like I said, after after it, after you start fighting on TV, then you start making the 50000 then 100000 then uh a quarter million and a half a million. It's just depending on you got to continue to win to get to those uh, levels of of money. Hmm. So, like, how how do promoters take advantage of fighters though? What is a typical scam that promoters will run on fighters that talk that you? I mean, hip to? I, I really. I, I really don't know. I, I can't. I, I'm being hundred percent honest with you. I I don't know because I I, I you can't take it. You can't take advantage of me. You uh, know so what I'm saying? You say I, I got a team. I got so, a team in place. So I don't. I don't know um, the the things that they do to get over on fighters. I don't know. So, so basically, you really need a a team of lawyers. Uh, advisors and stuff in place. Even even if you just got one lawyer, even if you just, you got you need one good lawyer, one good mm -hmm. lawyer, your manager, just like me. I got a manager, I got a lawyer. Uh, I got I got two trainers, but my trainers they have nothing to do with my business. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it, but my lawyer and my manager, they, we come together and you know what I'm saying? We 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 uh we uh we look at everything and we. We come to an agreement. Um, it's it's a back and forth thing where I accept this, no, I won't accept this. Yeah, I take this, no, I won't take that. It's it's a back and forth thing before you come to an agreement with a contract. Now, as a um, you 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 have five fights, one all five of your fights. 
was your uh, contract st- over with Don King at this point? Was it still intact when you got in? No, nah, it was still intact. Oh, it was still intact. It, it, so it was still intact. Only, only when I went to prison, it was non and void because I went to prison. Oh, okay, all right. So you 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 get in trouble for armed robbery or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I think most of the the uh, the the years though came from uh, punching the deputy in the face or whatever. Um, how when you live? What was your life like? You uh, at that point? Where was your head at? Um, I know when I called you today, you were preparing to pray. You are a Muslim now. Um, where's your head at then? How did you How did you get go from promising professional prospect, probably uh, keeping his life very clean? I know your brother did. I read a story about your brother uh, until he had his nasal surgery or whatever, drug free, positive guy. Um, your life was obsessed and, and, and into boxing. You you doing all the things right. How did you get off track there? What what happened? Where were you at? Well, I, I never I never got off track. I never got off track with boxing. Boxing uh-huh. always been my bread and butter. Never never got off track with boxing. I, I train all day, every day. You know what I'm saying? It it's just that I never left the streets alone. Uh-huh. That's what people don't understand. That's what people don't understand. When I got in that ring, I performed at the highest height. That's why I never lost. So I, I want people to understand. Let's not get things confused. I was never. I was, uh, my boxing career was never in jeopardy because because I took care of business uh, in that in that uh, in that gym every single day. Never missed a gym. Never missed a run. Never missed nothing. I was. I'm always in dog shape. That's no. why I take care of business while I get in that ring. I just never. I just never uh, left the streets alone. I'm a street dude. I grew up in the hood. Which, and, which, which you know, hood you grew I up just, in? Because I'm from St. Louis, so I'm from Beam Street. Beam. So you from you live on Palm? Well, no, nah, I, I live on Elliot. I'm from Elliot. I'm from Elliot and Palm. Elliot and Palm. Okay, I live. No, nah, Elliot and Greer. No, nah, Elliot and Greer. Okay, Elliot and Greer. Okay, so you right. You not too far from me. Um, no. Nah. So um, you uh, how 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 did you have time for the streets with the um? The, the the boxing regimen that you have if you were training like you were training listen you don't you don't train to midnight okay you train, you okay. you don't train, i try i train during the day and and all afternoon i'm saying at night time that's when that's when you get your that's when i got my time to do whatever i'm on, I, i'm gonna do you know what i'm saying and mm-hmm. you know that's where that idle time come in at when i'm done training when enough for me to do until the next day. So, you know, that's that's where all that idle time come in, that trouble came in at. Okay, so how have you how have you changed have you changed since then? What have you changed? Um do you have any regrets about uh said incidences that led to you being sentenced to eighteen years and serving eleven? Um what 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 do you feel about all that looking back? Nah man, I, I one thing about me I don't regret nothing in my life, like nothing. You know, all all things that led up until this point, it it was it was supposed to happen. You know what I'm saying? Me going to prison, me doing the things that I did to go to prison. I'm saying it it is it's all uh um. I mean, it 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 was just something for my life for me to go through. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And and I just feel that if I didn't go through those things. That I wouldn't be um, the, the 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 man that I am today, a, a growing man. That you know what I'm saying. That there's I got a family. I take care of my family. Um, I, that that's all it's about. You know what I'm saying. Me fighting, me training, and me being the best Muslim that I can be. That that that's all my life consists of. Okay, now let me ask you a question. You are in immaculate shape. Looking at you, very muscular cut up great shape how did you maintain your level of condition in the missouri state penitentiary system uh up there at boonville i know that sunny liston if you know sunny liston right yeah yeah sunny liston's uh uh boxing career he's from st louis missouri started in the missouri state penitentiary system do they still have boxing programs there um how did you 
do your conditioning and keep your body in shape as to so that when you got out you would be ready and then how was your nutrition and stuff in prison how did you how were you able to maintain yourself Oh well, like they they don't have like boxing programs in prison no more. They they cut that out like like in the early two thousands. But um, I mean, man, listen, it's all about the mental, and it's all about the individual. And you know, when I went to prison, I mean, I just stayed consistent with what I know, and that's working out. And you know, I worked out every day. I'm talking about every day. And I ate right. I didn't. I didn't eat prison food. You know what I'm saying. I didn't. Well, I didn't eat what they offered. I, I okay. went. I had. Uh, now hold on. Yeah, now, go ahead. Tell me exactly what a day of conditioning would consist of uh, for you in prison. I mean, I ran, uh, did calisthenics work, uh, weight training. Um, I mean, everything that whatever whatever prison had to offer, I was able to do. The only thing that that I didn't wasn't able to do was boxing because they didn't have bags, they didn't have no boxing equipment because I told you they they stopped it like in the early two thousands. Okay, so do, did you ever shadow box or anything like that, or did you just? Oh yeah, I shadow box. Yeah, I I did a lot of shadow boxing. Plus, I whooped a lot of ass in prison too. <laughs> You know, Vaughn, honestly, I would hear about some of that stuff from my high school teammates. They told me that you were uh, you were not the guy necessarily the best with. So, so you nah, be, be. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they told me Vaughn likes to likes to whoop ass every once in a while, man. I mean, yeah, man. You know, when you you uh, listen, when I went to prison, I was eighteen, man. Eighteen. I, I I I went from my last my last pro fight before I went to prison. I went from fighting at Madison Square Garden to to being in prison like six months later. I mean, you, you, you I mean you you look at you you look at that and you be like, wow, that's a hell of a turnaround. So you would think like, shit, he young. So I'm like. I mean, it's whatever. I mean, I'm I'm about that action anyway, so I got to get some type of rent. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, now, your nutrition. What kind? You said you didn't eat the prison food. What kind of nutrition program would you have? What exactly would you be? Um, I ate a lot of um. I mean, any any and all thing that was on canteen that was healthy. I ate a lot of tuna, a lot of um. Um, a lot of beans, a lot of, um, mm, uh, hold on, tuna, beans, rice, um, I ate a lot of cereal, um, mm, I mean, I mean, what, what, whatever it is, whatever it is that they offered that I could buy that was healthy for me, I ate it, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I didn't, um, but I, I definitely didn't eat that prison food. Definitely okay. not. Now, now, how did you keep your mind right over those eleven years? Watching your brother having the success he had, world championship level success and whatnot, and probably a lot of your peers that you had fought, beaten at times. Um, how were you able to stay mentally focused? Uh, did you have the support of your family and trainers in prison? How was everything? How did how did were you able to hold up? Well, it, it, man, listen. You know, people can tell you all day long, you know, you can do this, you can do that. You, bruh, it's on the individual because every day, every night is you in prison, not them. It's you, you got people that are supporting you, but at the same time, it's you that's in prison. It's me that did that time. It's me that laid in that bunk every day for 11 years. It's me that worked out every day. So I'm saying it, it just I, I just was 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 born with that mental strength that that you know what I'm saying you got to have that mental strength to be able to get through especially dealing with the 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 the, the, the everyday rigmarole of prison dealing with staff dealing with thousands of dudes and they attitudes and they move swings and I mean which I don't care about uh, none of that but you also you but you got to consider that because you got to think for other people. Because you know what I'm saying, you 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 beat somebody too bad in prison, you can get some more time for that. So you know, I I, I just used to beat them just enough, where I ain't get I ain't get no time. Oh man, 
Oh, wow. But have you calmed down since then? Because one thing guys would tell me is Vaughn is a hothead. Is this true or is this is this real? <laughs> um... I, I only get that way when someone rubbed me the wrong way, you know, but my, my, listen, my life consists of, um, and, and it's the honest God true. My life consists of, uh, taking care of these kids, um, training that it's all my life consists of, man. I promise you, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to take over the sport of boxing and I don't need, I don't have time for no mishaps. I don't need time for no setbacks. So that's I don't go out, I don't go out, uh, I don't hang out, I don't deal with men like that. You know what I'm saying? I I, I I'm a homebody. If I'm if I'm not at the gym or if I'm not taking these kids to school or picking these kids up from school, I'm at home. So, all right, we we heard about how life was in prison. 2015, then you were released. You know the date exactly? <laughs> No, nah, I only released 2016. Okay. March 7th, 7, 2016. Okay. Release March 7th, 2016. Your, your, what, 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 what do you do when you get out? Where's your head at? Where are your goals at? When was your first pro fight after you got out? Oh, man. I, I started training. I started training the next day of me Ooh. being out of prison. Okay. Um, that's, that's how serious, that's how serious. I was, or it is to me, because, you know, I talked about it for 11 years. So now it was time for me to put it into action. You know what I'm saying? Everything came to fruition for me. You know, I got through that prison time. I got out of prison. Um, I, I kicked it with my family the first day. The next day I was at the gym. And um, I think I, ha I had my first fight back. I got out March. I had my first fight back in October. Okay, October. So you, so you immediately got got right on the grind. Now you've had six. Oh fights, yeah, man. Six fights then since then, and have they all been stoppages? Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. So six fights, six stoppages. Where are you at now? Who's your promoter right now? Like, who are you? Are you signed with? Uh, well, I'm. I'm signed. I'm. Yeah, I'm signed with Main Events. Main Event. Okay. And where are you from a standpoint of a title shot? You 32 years old. Okay, not necessarily a spring chicken for the lighter weights. Um, you don't necessarily have a lot of time left. You are in the prime of your athleticism right now. How far do you think you are away from a title shot, uh, from a big opportunity? Um, yeah, where's your career at right now after six, six pro, six pro fights and six stoppages? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm on track. You know what I'm saying? All I got to do is continue to take care of business, and a world title is going to present itself. You know what I'm saying? It's going to present itself uh, sooner sooner than later. So all I got to do is keep taking care of these guys. Like, when I fight more third, all I got to do is keep taking care of these guys. And, you know, the, it, it's going to present itself, okay? period. Okay, so if you had a timetable, how how long do you think a world title is away for Vaughn Alexander right now? Um, not too far because, you know, you, you see, you see, you see these top guys, they say they fight, they say they losing, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be somebody mandatory. So, you know, it, it's only a matter of time before, um, a world title is presented to me. Okay, all right. So you say a lot. So who who is exactly the uh, who are the champions in your division right now? I'm not familiar with all the weight classes. Uh, weight classes in boxing right now. Um, I mean, you got. I mean, at, at what weight class? Sixty or sixty-eight? Uh, either one. Because I, I told I'm ca I'm campaigning I'm campaigning at both. But at one sixty, you got um, Canelo, Triple G. You got the Cholo, one of the Cholo brothers. You got um, uh, um, a guy named Andres. You got, uh, I mean, you got, you got uh, nice competition at sixty and sixty-eight. I mean, them two, them two are the hottest. Uh, besides uh, welterweight, sixty and sixty-eight is two of the hot, hottest weight divisions out there. Okay. All right. Um. Very okay. So. You say you not. I, I didn't know that was Canelo's uh, a division right there, but um, 
uh, let's talk about your brother a little bit. Your brother, for a couple fights, he hadn't looked um, necessarily like himself. Uh, came out that he had struggled with an addiction to some, uh, some. Be quiet, girl. To pain pills for a while, but now he said to be back in form. His next fight is when is his next fight? Uh, his fight uh February seventeenth uh in El Paso, Texas. And, and, and who's he fighting now? Uh, Victor Ortiz. Victor Ortiz, and is that for a title? Uh, no, nah, I don't think so. But Devin just fought. Devin fought um a couple months ago. Okay, all right. So this is his, his second fight after his struggle. Um, yeah. How, how how far do you think do you think Devin is back in prime form right now? Man, Devin, Devin, Devin back, Devin back where he needs to be. Yeah, Devin back in the hunt to be world champion again. Okay, that's awesome. You got you guys won't. When do you would you like to fight on the same card as him uh, in the near future? Oh, uh, it's, it's definitely gonna happen. All he gotta do is take care of his business. I continue to take care of my business. Oh, it's definitely gonna happen. And we, where would you like that to happen? Would you like it to happen in St. Louis, or it doesn't matter? Where, oh, it's where? definitely gonna be. It's definitely gonna be in St. Louis at the Scott Trade Center. We definitely gonna sell that thing out. Okay, all right. That's what's up. That's what's up. Uh, if you had one fighter you'd like to fight, Vaughn, who who is it that you you would target right now? Listen, it ain't it ain't about who I want. I want every head, everybody that's somebody that's who I want. It, I, I ain't got no individual person that. I want to fight him. Any anybody in the top, anybody in the top at one sixty, anybody at top at one sixty eight. That's who I want. Okay, that's what's up. Now let me ask you another question: Have you ever considered possibly uh, fighting in mixed martial arts? Maybe and uh, no, no. <laughs> so that's a no. Why not, man? I mean, I was because because I was, I was blessed. I was blessed with superb skills with my hands. And you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't do something that I wouldn't, tra- I wasn't trained to do. Ah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because you at this point you don't have any grappling or anything like I, that. I, none, none of that. So you know, I, I, I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I'm at a disadvantage. So you know, boxing is my bread and butter, and and plus, and plus, boxing make 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 way more money. Yeah, yeah, I, that's what I was about to say. Like. You wouldn't even be making as much money boxing on the lower level cards. You, I mean, God, it's ten thousand dollars for an entry level UFC fight. That's way below your league, right? Yeah, I mean, so you know that, that it it it'll take me a million years to get, you know, what I'm saying the type of money that boxing offers. You know, Bob, I mean, you get paid in boxing. What's uh? And and what's, I'm talking and I'm talking about and I'm talking about. Even even on your build up time, you make more money than mixed martial arts. What 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 were you making during your build up time, or is, or is this your build up time? I started out I, when I was with Don. I, with me first turning pro, I started off making like ten grand. Ten grand, okay, damn. That that, that that's with me. That's with me not having no 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 pro fights or none of that. So that's that that's where my start at, and you know you build you build on that. And when you got out of prison, was it ten grand again or more? Oh, uh, definitely more. Oh wow! So you were making more <laughs> than you were. All right. Well then, yeah, boxing is a much richer scene than uh, mixed martial arts at this point. Well, Vaughn, uh, thanks for your time here. At, I'll stay on the line real quick, but thanks for your time at the school, of Black Negro Jiu-Jitsu. If you got any shout outs to any sponsors, anybody, you can go ahead and do those now. I mean, I just shout out, shout out to my team and. Um, you know, we're going to continue to get this word. Hope you guys really enjoyed that interview. I had an awesome time talking to Vaughn Alexander. Uh, I hope to talk to Devon Alexander before his matchup with Victor Ortiz on the uh, the Kovalev undercard. What What is the date on that, Dave? Uh, pull that up for you right now, Leroy. It is... February 17th, so I think this weekend I'm coming, if I got my dates right. Well, okay. Well, I want to talk to him at least after the the uh, the Ortiz matchup. Hopefully, we get to sit down with him. We should be having Curtis Blaze on if his manager quits bullshitting uh, pretty soon. <laughs> Man, 
I talked to him like two months ago, and he was supposed to get me an interview before this fight. So I definitely got to get back. Curtis Blaze is down with it, but uh, yeah, man, all things go through his manager. Uh, but let, let's do the 221 rundown. Now, that, speaking of Curtis Blades, um, I enjoyed the fights. I enjoyed the card coming from down under. Uh, the Australian fighters, I was hating on them before the card, but they did great. Luke Jumo upset Daiichi Abe, not because he's a good fighter, but because Daiichi Abe got too tired from whipping his ass and trying to finish him. Basically, that's how that one went. Abe has nothing to be ashamed of. If he beats his ass worse in the first round, then it's like Jumo doesn't win. Jumo's not a better fighter than Abe. Um, Quinones beats uh, Tarotu, Tarotu Ishihar in a, in, a, in a good fight, good back and forth fight. Ishihar did look terrible, just was outdone by a more technical fighter in every area. Ross Pearson outdoes Mizuto Hirota. He was almost finished there uh, in the, at the end of the second round. But uh, for the most part, he controlled the fight and was able to get a nice uh, boxing base, striking base decision. Juicy A Formiga chokes out Ben Nguyen. I guess he knocked him down and then got to choke. I don't know why people thought Ben Nguyen had so much of a chance. I thought there was a Juicy A Formiga spot, but I'm listening. But Ben Nguyen is talented. It's just, I think Formiga is like a championship gatekeeper. And I don't think Ben Nguyen has gotten to the gate quite yet. Dave, if you have anything to say, brother, you're more than willing to uh, be able to step in. Yeah, I've seen, uh, I saw some of the fights, so you'll hear me interject for, for some of the, the bigger fights, like the Rockhold and, and uh, Romero and the Curtis Blades fight. But I'll let you run down the rest of these, these fights, and I'll let you know if I have any uh, opinion on those. All right. Alexander Volkanovsky beats the tar out of Jeremy Kennedy. I almost thought that his head was going to go through the mat at times. And Jeremy Kennedy's not a scrub, but man, did he look like one. That's how good Volkanovski is looking these days, man. I, I thought that was going to be a really competitive matchup, and Volkanovski just beat the piss out of Jeremy Kennedy, man. Very impressive performance by Volkanovski. I wish I would have... I just didn't think Jeremy Kennedy was that bad a fighter. Or I would have had more Volkanovski on DraftKings, but man, Volkanovski just trashed him. Israel Adesanya versus Rob Wilkinson. Listen, Rob Wilkinson got finished in the second. He has nothing to be ashamed of, though, man. He went out there and did it. He won the first round. Um, he did exactly what he, he should have been trying to do. Perfect game plan. Just um, his, uh, he just couldn't, uh, I guess he was so tired from the wrestling uh, for that entire first round and trying to continually get Adesanya, the better athlete, down that he couldn't sustain it. He ends up being finished uh, in the second round, but nothing to be ashamed of. Israel Adesanya better work on his wrestling, man, uh, or else uh, he, he's going to take some L's here because that was a, Wilkinson is no way a high-level grappler, and uh, he was giving Adesanya the blues. Adesanya looked like magic on the feet, though. I was very impressed there. Um, I... I don't think Adesanya is an Australian. No, he's not. All right. No, he's uh, not. New Zealand. He resides in New Zealand by way of Nigeria. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So he's a New Zealander. Okay, all right. Yeah, so he's a Kiwi. So he, he reps New Zealand, but by way of, of Nigeria. Ah, all right, all right. Because I, I, they were saying he was a local fighter, but I was like, what? Okay. Uh, Other Cam, Dong Young Cam, wins a uh, patient striking-based decision over Damian Brown. Uh, I don't like New Kim, but New Kim is more intelligent and he fights better, but uh, not very entertaining at all. Damian Brown, B. Down Brown, school of black Negro Jitsu veteran, he just what? He's just too foot slow uh, to kind of win the boxing exchanges against the higher levels of division. Um, Tyson Pedro uh, against Saberbek Saparov. Saparov, if Saparov would stop be getting matched up against these uh, killers, man. Uh, he could have a chance as he's got a really nice wrestling game. His body is all broken down, but he could get, he could win some fights in the UFC if he gets the right matchups. You know, his body is he got knee injuries and stuff like that. That being said, um, Pedro uh, was not super impressive, but yeah, I like what I'm seeing from Pedro. He's got to fix some holes. He's got to develop a better boxing game, better striking game, but it's it's coming along. His his grappling is pretty good. He's just got to make it more less sporadic and more technical and precise there. Jake Matthews uh, versus Jing Liang. 
Li Jing Liang um, in a very um, sloppy matchup. I, I didn't think Jake Matthews looked super impressive technically, but he was dropping Jing Liang, so whatever, I guess. Um, I mean, and, and Jing Liang did hit him with the Ric Flair and try to gouge his eye. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's that's like you know if I don't think that was on purpose. Like all the uh, sometimes I think when uh, a a foreign fighter or a non-white fighter has a foul against a white fighter, the white journalists go crazy. Um, and I and I say that because you know Matt the Mortal Brown, right? Yes, Matt the Mortal Brown. He's and he's one of my favorite fighters. He is one of the dirtiest fighters that there ever has been. And you never see people talking about, oh man, the mortal, he was grabbing the cage and he faked that low blow and all that kind of stuff. Like people never say that about Matt Brown. But then when some non-white fighter does the smallest things, I know G Lee gouged his eyes, but do you really think it was really premeditated or he was getting strangled and he was trying to get out, which that's the right defense. But I don't know if he was trying to gouge his eye. You know, I don't think he was like, he made a concerted effort. I think he was trying to prevent strangulation and his fingers just so happened to go into the eyes. Yeah, I don't know if it was, it was premeditated or not. It might have just been uh, uh, the heat of the moment, will to survive type of thing. Um, that was tight, was, man. That was that was super tight. It, it was definitely it was definitely tight. I mean, it, it, it probably I mean Jake Matthews won the fight regardless, but uh, it, it possibly cost him the, the stoppage there. I, I think at that point the refs got to interject and, and at least take a point or do something. I'm not I'm not out there. I'm not uh, on on my on the the white journalist high horse um, saying you know it was blatant and, and it's disgusting and, and all the the nonsense that's been spewed about um, Jing Liang, but. I think that the refs got to, especially in, a, in a, a finishing type of position, the refs got to interject and at least take a point or do something in that in that scenario. Um, like you said, I, I'm not certain if it's premeditated. It might just be survival mode, um, and I'm not all up in in the air. I kind of shrugged it off when I, I saw it, but something's got to. He's got to be docked a point at least. Is, is the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, I mean, like it, it seems to me is is when people when white fighters commit fouls. It's way less controversy than when Yoel Romero and I mean these these are white fighters, man. Well, I'm not, I don't have nothing against either side, but listen, <laughs> Jacare is trying to take Yoel Romero down so he can strangle him. I might grab the cage too, maybe. I mean, like that's a bad situation to be in, you know. But when Matt Brown does it, oh man, Matt Brown's a savage. Oh. oh Creed and color aside, Romero's <laughs> definitely in, in the uh, Matt Brown school of dirty fighters. No, Matt, actually, Matt Brown is the dirtiest, man. I don't know. Romero, taking, Romero has a tendency, I feel like, to hold a cage, taking that extra minute to, to get off the, the stool against um, against Kennedy, the, 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 the pouring of the water all over his body, so he's extra slippery. I mean, he's not that, that Cuban refugee camp that, that you know, they do anything to, to survive, you know. My man is, he's like 60, but he's pumped up with testosterone. Um, I have all the respect in the world for the guy because he's 40 and he's explosive as hell. Um, I still don't think you sound has done their job with him, but he's definitely in, in, uh, in he's definitely up there with some of the dirtiest weasel fighters in the game, that's for sure. Yo, Romero is just a weird dude, man. I think that's all it is. He's, I love Yo, but yeah. I don't think Lee Jing Liang meant to do it. Get off his back. Anyway, Tai t- t- Vasa uh, scorches Surreal Acker. And just, poor, why didn't the referee stop that like 100 punches before it did stop, man? Um, that and was. Then he proceeds to chug beer out of a shoe, out of an Adidas shell toe. And he's probably got foot fungus. Yeah, I mean, Surreal Asker is not a guy that. He's got he's got athletic deficiencies. He's not made. I guess this is what will be his role in the UFC: win fights against low level fighters, lose fights against upcoming prospects. Um, that's what he does. Yeah, he's he's definitely the true. I, I would say the true definition of um, of a gatekeeper. He's like the heavyweight Marcus Brimage. Yeah, like, yeah. He, he, 
<laughs> where they feed him, they, they, he beats up on he beats up on the scrubs, and then they feed him to the up and coming prospects. Yeah, when we when we so, see Surreal Asker against a nine low level heavyweight, we know it's time for for murder. <laughs> basically, basically, it's time for a human sacrifice. <laughs> Are you gonna put up or shut up? If you're if you're really some like not even if you're really worth the hype, if you have some hype and you can kind of live up to it, you'll you'll beat up on this dude and finish him in the first round. If you're a can, you're just gonna get fucking your ass handed to you by Surreal. So that's like because Surreal, like, Surreal is not a bad fighter. He's not. Um, he just like, but I hope that the UFC uses that 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 to formula more so that people know to get excited when they see a can. You know, and so we know it's time for slaughter. You know, some real asker, and the whole crowd goes crazy because they know that the dude he's fighting is about to murder him. <laughs> like, um, they got to do that more. But surreal is not bad. But that should be that's about what you use him for because he has his limitations. Um, next fight up, Curtis Blades, very impressive against Mark Hunt. I thought Curtis Blades was gonna get knocked out by Mark Hunt, just barely avoided it. Just barely did he did he avoid it. He looked super impressive, though. I was very impressed by his performance and how he ragdolled Mark Hunt. I didn't even understand that. Um, he just threw Mark Hunt around like he was nobody. Yeah, he he. So I was definitely impressed. Um, I think I was in the camp. I was in the camp that <clears throat> either either Curtis Blades absolutely abolishes him. And obliterates him on the ground. Uh, I don't. I don't think I. I saw him ragdolling Mark Hunt the way he did, just kind of belly to back suplexing him uh, all over the cage. But um, I thought it was either Mark Hunt by KO or um, or Curtis Blades by a dominant decision like that. Um, I think I think Curtis Blades. I think with a little bit more fine tuning. I think he's. He's up there. I mean, he gave he gave Ngannou a test, and if it wasn't for um, it was a messed up eye that stopped the fight, um, he was someone who kind of kind of you know I, I think with, with a little bit more improvement in his game, I think I want to see a rematch with him between him and France, um, and I, I think that he's really come a long way, and I think he's still got strides to, to make in his game, but I think he's definitely got a a future in the heavyweight division, that's for sure. Very very. Um... Very, very impressive by Curtis Blades. Speaking of, well, well, we'll get to that news in a second. Next up in the main event, Yo Romero does what we all thought he would do, and he knocks the shit out of Luke Rocco because Luke Rocco can't box. If Rocco had a boxing game, he would be the shit, but he doesn't, so he will continuously get knocked out by people with good boxing. That's just what's, and, and good wrestling that he can't take down. Luke Rocco is an awesome fighter, but man, how has he been fighting for 10 years? And he has never figured out how to box. Like, why? What is with this? I I don't know. And I think I think more so than than, than that is um, is why wasn't he, he was pieced, pieced up prior to like we we've all known he's he's somewhat chinny for a while now. But it, it, I and I think we were a lot of us, especially in the the, the DFS world, right? Expected you well to, to stop them and, and stop them, you know, one of the earlier middle rounds. But uh, it's crazy that he got stopped by um, he got stopped by Romero. Uh, I mean, not Romero by Bisping. Um, it's possible that uh, I, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to get at and the theory I, I, I have is I think a, a somewhat fluky win. And, and I'm a little biased here because I'm I'm a big Chris Weidman guy because he's a New York guy. But I think one a fight that I think Luke was losing. He, I think he was clearly losing. Yeah, he and was. Chris Wyman does some silly shit. Throws that spinning back kick, gets taken down, and just gets beat up by somebody with possibly possibly the best ground and pound in the UFC, right? And I think after that, it seems like Luke just fell in love with his his boxing. He, he thought he was a boxer all of a sudden. He uh, tried that shit against Bisping, got knocked out, and then he he almost got. He got pieced up by David Branch. It was a little, you know, a little wobbly for a bit. Ended up, you know, taking him down, going back to that ground and pound, stopping the fight. And then, uh, 
kind of went back to it here against Romero. He, he did a good job of keeping the distance in that first round or two with some leg kicks, and I don't know what, what happened. He kind of went away from it and then just got caught with that overhand left, and, and then that second punch just – Yoel just punched him. He punched, he punched him out of way out of Perth. He just punched him in his head. His head bounced off the, the ring. Uh, it, it was absurd. So I don't know, man. Um, he, I think he just fell in love with his boxing, and I think that's that's been his Achilles heel the last few fights, even in, in the fight he won against David Branch. So, yeah, that's it, about it. Yeah, I think no, I don't think Luke Rojo is a fluke champion. I used to think he'd never be champion. He's a championship level fighter. It's just, man, his boxing is just atrocious. I agree. I, I don't disagree that he's not. Uh, I agree 100 percent that he's he's up there with the championship level fighters. It's just, I think that he doesn't, for some reason, he doesn't implement a uh, a game plan in the sense that like he doesn't work to his strengths. He tries to box with guys who are better boxers than him or better on the feet than him, and especially when he's chinny too. And um, I don't know, I. I I feel like, and, and this might be an outlandish statement, but if it seems like everybody who goes to work with Henry Hoof too, right? He's supposed to be a, this this great Dutch kickboxer, right? this great Dutch kickboxing trainer, and it seems like everybody who's been going to his camp in South Florida has been struggling with him recently. That's just an observation I I, I, I made, and, and maybe it's just recency bias, and maybe I have to go back and look at it. But it seems like dudes who who've, who've to move their camps or been training strictly on their Henry Hoof haven't been looking that great on the feet or have been just getting worked. Um, so I don't know, man. I don't know. He's got to do, I think Luke's got to reassess, reassess his game plans going forward and, and maybe, maybe change camps or bring in some new people and, and, and work on some new stuff. Cause he's definitely got the championship level skill set, but um, the game plan I don't feel like is there. Yeah, well, I, I mean, he's just, I mean, some fighters, you could teach them whatever you want to teach them, but they are who they are. We have That's to, true. we are, we have to recognize that everybody doesn't have the propensity to become great at boxing, great at jujitsu. Some people just don't have the talent to, you know, to pull that kind of stuff off. So, uh, Luke Rockhold, um, maybe that it's just who he is, man. He's just, he's got, a, most fighters in mixed martial arts has flaws, have flaws because you have to, Gain all these high level skill sets, and you know, that's his flaw. Uh, on to the next one, though. Curtis Blades, uh, is um, on the last fight of his contract, so well, no, he's got two fights left, so he's got one more after this, and he's talking about leaving for Bellator if um, UFC won't pay up. I think that's the right to move, lesser competition, more money. Um, hell, he's a. It doesn't matter where you win in the championship, and if the Ali act goes into effect or something like that, maybe we'll see it where the championship doesn't have anything to do with individual organizations, which I think would be better. That promotional companies stay about promoting, and uh, the commissions hand out the belts. But uh, what do you think about Curtis Blades leaving for Bellator? I mean, if the money's right, uh, I don't doubt him. I mean, I don't fault him for leaving to Bellator. Um, he's he's got talent that would that would be a huge signing, I think, for for Bellator. Um, I think they should definitely aggressively pursue him if the UFC, you know, kind of falls asleep at the wheel. Uh, he's he's a, a young, exciting heavyweight. What is he? Only twenty six or twenty seven, I believe. Um, he's not even mature in his career, right? Heavyweights don't get don't get good until they're like even in their mid 30s right um but uh I, I think that they if i'm bellator i i aggressively pursue curtis blades i poach him i think they could kind of build a the heavyweight division around him after this grand prix uh give him a few fights tune him up feed him one of these these fucking geriatric heavyweight champions that are about to be crowned um and see him run, see him run with that that belt. I mean, I think he can build a whole division around a, a young guy who's who's fun to watch. He's got great wrestling. His boxing's improving. Is just straight up. It's not that usual like single leg or double leg. Take him down and grind him out. It's like that belly to back, ragdoll, like ridiculous strength. 
They can um, feed up uh, Frank Mir and, uh, and all the other watch the heavyweights. My geez, boy, my boy. <laughs> <laughs> Man, oh God, listen. Frank Mir is one of my favorite fighters of all time. Fedor is one of my favorite fighters of all time. But man, you you guys need to hang this shit up, man. Like, it, this is ridiculous. Frank, Frank Mir is all fat. Fedor is basically all washed up. He's not good anymore. Like, the it, this is it's sad to watch. Who else they got? Chael Sonnen, you know. Like, she come a on. Bunch of late heavies moving up to heavyweight. They uh, they got a bunch of. Sonnen. Rampage, you know what I'm saying? Like, come Phil on, Davis. man. Phil Davis is still so much. I mean, he's never been exciting to watch. He's got talent. Um, Ryan Bader. I mean, they, 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 there's some talent there that are light heavy. He's kind of moving up to, to heavyweight. And I think that, I think Curtis Blades would be a great signing. I think that's some new new blood. I think you could kind of build a, a light heavyweight or a heavyweight division around Phil Davis, him, and Ryan Bader, right? And I mean, the rest of those guys are, the rest of those guys are grandpas. No offense, but um, I mean, they, they they could definitely use that injection of some good young blood. Like they they're doing some of the right things, and I think that this would be a the right move for Bellator to make, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I, I um I I'd like if he I would like if he went to sign a Bellator. I'd like better to see him in the UFC. Um, next up we got John Jones. Man, his his manager is saying it's a ninety five percent chance. That he fights in 2018. So the case with John Jones is looking damn good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so I hope we see John Jones in the cage this year, man. Um, what do you think of that, Dave? I mean, I, once again, is I would love to see that. I love to see him back. Um, I think we deserve a a Cormier and John Jones trilogy. The first fight was close. Um, the second fight fight was good up until uh, Joe, Jones kicked Daniel Cormier's head off, um, but I think that's that one chip on Daniel's Daniel's shoulder. I don't think he'll ever be vindicated or justified unless he has that W over John Jones. Um, I think the fans deserve that that trilogy. Um, I hope he's back, and I hope we see that trilogy. And uh, you know that. It, if he beats Dan- Daniel the third time, especially in a convincing fashion, like another knockout, then I think we cement his his place as the best light heavyweight ever and possibly one of the best pound-for-pound fighters. And if uh, Dan- Daniel beats him, then Daniel's finally over that hump. He hasn't been able to get Wait a minute. Dan- Daniel Cormier is not going to be. I don't want to see Daniel Cormier versus John Jones 3. For what, for what reason? So Daniel Cormier can get smashed again? I mean, I think he deserves. I, I mean, regardless of, of being positive, or not, I think he deserves the, the the trilogy. It's not like, hey, listen, if he got if he got smashed in the first fight, if he got his head blown off in the first fight, right? If he got rocked or, or whatever and, and completely put away, and then that happened again in the second fight, then that's understandable. First, he got down. No, when he got dominated, it was like forty. Hey. It was. It was. I think it was closer to three to two. I think. I think if you go back and rewatch that fight, I think it was closer to three to two. I think when I watched the fight too, the first time around, I think it was four to one, and I think that that Jones was just watching him. But I think if you go back, it was actually a little bit close. I think it was three to two. That second fight, I think Daniel started decently. I mean, you could have get, given those. Was it? If I recall correctly, I knocked out in the third. I think you could have given either one of those two rounds to either one of those men. It could have been 2-0 in either way, 1-1. One, one. Um, I, I think, listen, just to be vindicated, I think he deserves that last, that one more. If he gets his head head rocked off, then that's it. You know, there's nothing else to see here, folks. Keep it moving. But uh, I think we see that trilogy, and then I think – UFC has to make that play to bring Brock back, and we see John Jones versus Brock sometime in 2019, hopefully. Yeah. Well, you know, no, nah, we, we're going to see um, John. We're going to see Daniel Cormier versus Stipe, and I think Daniel Cormier wins that fight. Um, there's nothing that Stipe does better than uh, Daniel Cormier, and Daniel Cormier would have his argument for greatest fight of all time. Then John Jones will whoop his ass again, and that argument will be <laughs> null and void. Um,. But I, I'm a big, I'm a Dan Cormier fan. But listen, man, he just he's not big enough, tall enough to go to strike with with Jones, man. It's just bottom line. It's just like anatomy. He just he's not a true heavyweight for real, you know. And John Jones has a true heavyweight frame. 
Um, uh, let's go on to our next topic here. Rashad Evans has been advising Tyron Woodley to uh, stop fighting uh, Dana White. Um, he said that he's the original Tyron Woodley. Rashad said he wasted a lot of time arguing with Dana White and whatnot, but I can't blame Tyron Woodley, man. The kind of things that Dana says about Tyron are disgusting. Uh, he's not promoting him. He's it, it, it's it's a, if you're a promoter, you're supposed to promote your fighter, you know. And Dana White is doing the opposite, and Tyron Woodley is a champion. I just can't understand it. You know, like it's it's bad for, it's bad business. You're supposed to be making people believe that this fighter is worth purchasing, and when you don't do that, well, then it's good that the fighter tries to hold his uh, his worth. So I like what Tyron Woodley is doing, man. He's defending himself. Uh, he defends himself against the white journalists all the time when he talks about the race issues and in, uh, in fighting. I think Tyron Woodley is is right on point. I don't think he's wasting time. I think he's just protecting his brand. Dave, what do you think? I, I, I mean, I respect Tyron, and Tyron's a great fighter and a great champion. Uh, and we've had this conversation again. Uh, Uncle Dana just shits on whoever he wants to shit on. If somebody doesn't doesn't live up to his caliber, or they're not exciting in his eyes, or whatever the case might be, then you're, you're kind of in his doghouse, and he doesn't promote you, and you just talk shit. Um I mean, his, I guess, Dana, I can't speak for Dana, but I would assume his point of view is after two of the most boring fights we've ever seen in life when he fought Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Um, I think that's that's kind of dampened Dana's view on him. But I think Tyron, Tyron's got knockout power. We've seen him absolutely starch Robbie Lawler. Um, not to say that that hasn't happened in the past, but um, to Robbie Lawler, but... Um, Tyron's got all the tools to be a great champion. He fights smart. He goes out there to win, right? And at the end of the day, the fighters got to protect themselves and protect their brand. They don't, they technically, I don't want to say this because it's going to come off wrong, but they don't really owe, they owe, they don't owe anything to us in the sense of taking unnecessary damage as fans, right? Just because fans are heckling them or booing them doesn't mean that they should go out there and, and get away from their style and, and, Trade, try and trade bombs just because that's what fans want to see, right? Uh, if you're a championship fighter, your 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 goal first and foremost, I think, is to protect that belt and protect yourself. And but Tyron Woodley, Tyron Woodley, man, he's not born. He listen, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson is a beast, and he was able to shut down his offense and beat the shit out of him at times. So he, he's he's a very very good fighter. Yeah, that was a very impressive performance. That wasn't boring at all. I I I think it was a great fight. Tactically, right, for, for guys like yourself and myself, I feel like who could kind of pick apart a fight or analyze a fight and guys that analyze a fight, I think that's, you know, that's a, you know, a solid, like, that's like, like uh, I was going to say, that, that's like a solid lesson in craftsmanship, right? Like, the guy has shown you the be- he's the best at his craft. Um, but I would say it's a casual fan or somebody just watching, somebody tuning into the UFC for her the first time trying to get into the UFC, they might not respect that or might not enjoy that. And, and Dana, the type of fighters he wants are guys who are going to give you these flash knockouts or just really flashy, re- really gaudy fighters. And sometimes those those guys have a lot of hype. They come in and they, they fizzle out, right? Um, and I, I think Tyron is a great champion. I think he's he's got a great skill set. For the most part, I mean, besides besides sometimes when he fights with his, his back up against the cage, which is... Uh, um, isn't the most savvy. I think he's got a fairly decent ring IQ. Um, and he just, he uses all his weapons. He comes in with a game plan and implements it and implements it well. And he's got to protect himself. He's got to protect his, his brand. And if Damon doesn't like that, then tough shit. Like, they, they, what's he going to do? Like, every fighter is not going to be a Conor McGregor. Every fighter is not going to be a Nate Diaz. They're not going to give you what you, what you want to see. Styles make fights, right? You're going to have different types of fighters and you got to live with it. And he's got to be a better... As a president of the organization, he's got to be a better promoter. You shouldn't be shitting on your fighters. Right? You're giving fans the wrong perception. Dana White so. doesn't like money, man. What What are you doing? This is crazy. Like, you're supposed to, if the champion has a boring performance, please explain to us why, we, you know, the, the reason why and why we should tune in again. Don't go shit on them and, like, 
you know, that's not how you make money. If Dana White doesn't like money, though, that's on him. Uh, on to the next topic, though. Let's go to uh, Ronda Rousey at Elimination Chamber. That's where she will sign her Raw contract. Elimination Chamber will be in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, are you excited? I mean, I don't watch. I don't really watch WWE. Uh, but I, I'm not gonna lie. I was a little amped. I was. I was checking the. Um, I was checking Twitter when the Royal Rumble was going on to see if she popped out as like the 30th contestant in the uh, in the Women's Royal Rumble. And then I saw they were like, oh, Ronda Rousey didn't come out, whatever. I stopped tuning into Twitter, and I guess the next day, um, my fiancé showed me that Ronda Rousey actually did make an appearance at, at Royal Rumble. She came out and, I guess, pointed to the WrestleMania, um, WrestleMania banner. So I think it's definitely interesting. Um, I, will be, I will be using my buddy's account to tune in to, um, to probably Elimination Chamber just to see the Ronda Rousey appearance. Um, or if he hosts something, then maybe I'll go over his house. Uh, I don't get excited for WWE much anymore, but um, I think that's pretty cool. I know I've heard she's she hasn't been getting along with people in the locker room. I don't know. You could probably speak better to this than, than I can, Lara. In the so, WWE locker room? Something along those lines. I, I heard that there was um, there's some. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, what? Second. That yeah, sounds like a storyline. Maybe. Give me a second. Uh, Ronda. I don't know. I'm, look, while you're doing that, I'm excited about seeing Ronda Rousey. Um, I'm excited to see what they're going to do with her, how they're going to use her. I, of course, watched the Royal Rumble. Super cool to see her come out. I uh, I think she's got a great future. I think she uh, she's a big pro wrestling fan, so she understands the business. Uh, I'm excited about Ronda Rousey. She she's embracing the history with the with the Rowdy Piper jacket. I, uh, I I look forward to her making memories here at WrestleMania as uh, as an awesome draw, man. Like, um, I, I think she can come. She's still young enough to come back to fight in one day. But I'm interested to see what this road holds for. And, you know, all those girls out there talking shit, she can still whip most of your asses. Just not the girls with the high-level striking games and high-level grappling games, too. Just not Amanda Nunes, not Holly Holm. Maybe not side boy, but most of you hoes would get the business. So just know. So Lara here is something I pulled up and said, in case you didn't know, Ronda Rousey's WWE arrival has been the biggest story in wrestling in all of 2018. Immediately after her arrival, she received a lot of flack from the women in WWE who felt that she had overshadowed the historic Women's World Rumble. Women such as Nia Jax and Nikki Bella went on social media and let their feelings be known. Chael Sonnen weighed in on the locker room backlash and provided his own thoughts on the matter. Oh, this is all story. This is all this is all kayfabe, though. You know, do you think that the WWE would would like if somebody was airing out dirty locker room laundry? This is all look. This is all driving the storyline. You know, um, about her arrival, and you know that's that's all. That's what this is about. All everybody's jealous. Everybody's coming for Ronda Rousey. She's got his her against the world. That's all that is. Well, you, you're a resident WWE expert. So oh man, say, you know I love pro wrestling. That's but that listen, that's how you promote fights and fighters, man. Is you get people talking, people talking shit and stuff like that. Like that's what MMA fighters don't understand. Nobody cares about the in ring product. The out of the ring drama is more entertaining than the in ring product. Floyd Mayweather's uh, what are those? In, not embedded, but what do you call those series he has before the fights where? know what the hell they are now since he signed that showtime contract i remember back in the day when i was in college it was um the 24 sevens or what yeah yeah 24 7 like the 24 sevens like that's what gets the casual fan excited and engaged all the trash talking and looking at people's lives and meeting their families like that's what that's how mick foley mankind that's how he caught on is we got to look at his life and who he really was and people fell in love with him so the in-ring product is less spectacular if it is is not really spectacular if it's not backed up by investment you know what i'm saying like if i'm investment been invest, highly invested in a, in a human being and then they go out and fight i care about that fight because i know them i've seen their family i know this thing about their life you know i know all this stuff about their life 
and now I care about them, their safety, their well-being, such as yada, yada, yada. But anyway, that's how you promote a fighter's appearance. That's how you promote their income and people talking trash about them, such and such and such. This is all good stuff. W, uh, UFC Bellator could learn from this. Um, let's see here. Uh, rumors of Floyd Mayweather coming to MMA, I think it's BS. They're talking about him fighting CM Punk. I don't think he ever steps into an MMA cage, ever. That is dangerous uh, for a white belt grappler like himself. Or maybe he's not. Maybe he's been training jiu-jitsu all this time. Um, Dave, what do you think of Floyd Mayweather in MMA? You think it's as much BS as me? I do. I think he's, his ego is too large to ever let him see to ever have him see an L of any sort. Um, I don't think there's enough money in a fight between him and CM Punk. You make way more in a night of boxing uh, in a ring that he owns, you know, uh, somewhere where he's never been beaten. He seems a little egomaniacal uh, and very full of himself, so I don't feel like he's the type of guy who would ever want to see an L on any type of record of his. So um, I think it's... It's a crock of shit, to be brutally honest. Um, I think I think we possibly see Conor go back to boxing before we see Floyd come come to the MMA. Um, so that that's that's my two cents on it. Um, kind of that that's about all I got. Yeah, I mean, if if he did do an MMA career, he would be smart about it and do some tune-up fights and stuff. You know, he's not dumb. MMA promoters are dumb. They just take you and throw you in there. But if you're smart and you have a very valuable commodity, you want to put them in there against cans, let them warm up. You know, don't ruin the money. You don't throw the big money fighter in again. You know, so I, um, yeah, I, I don't think that would ever happen. If it did happen, Floyd would definitely have no fights and some get ready type spots. And then you see maybe a fight. But I don't think it will, especially at 40. Uh... Let's see here. I think that about does it for the School of Black Negro Tissue this week, guys. Uh, that's all. That's it. I, I don't have too much else to talk about that's interesting. Um, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, we got some, I got to line up some more guests so we can have some more uh, wonderful moments on the podcast. So, but we got the MMA Edge Fantasy Podcast coming up probably, what's today? Tuesday, Thursday. We've got Black Market Picks, of course. And, uh, of course, we got School Black Negro Jitsu next week. So, we'll, yeah. It, you know, and make sure you enroll, hit subscribe on whatever platform you're on. But I hope you enjoyed the podcast today, guys. Um, I had fun. I hope you did, too. Enroll now in the School Black Negro Jitsu is free. Peace out.